Hello, everyone. We thank you for joining us. Just want to let you know as we get things going that you are in the right place. Just going to get things going in about another minute as we allow more people to, to log in. But again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Hello once again, everyone, just letting you know that you are in the right place. This is the Safety and Health Webinar sponsored by Origami Risk. Just going to allow a little more time, another 30 seconds or so before we get going. Okay, an official hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Synergizing Safety and Risk, an Integrated Risk Management Success Journey, sponsored by Origami Risk. My name is Kevin Drulli, and I'm an Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well. In a few minutes, we'll start a presentation, but first, let's review some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and may not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not necessarily mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the Send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and we'll let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and introduce our speakers. Today we have Jeff Enzinger, Jeff Emmerich, and Jenna Beachley. Jeff Enzinger is a senior sales executive at Origami Risk who brings more than 20 years of direct experience in the safety and risk management software space. Jeff Emmerich serves as corporate safety director for Ozinga Brothers, the largest family-owned ready-mix concrete supplier in the United States. Jenna, our risk program specialist at Origami Risk, has worked in the insurance industry for six years. She's taken part in the implementation of both the risk management information system and environmental health and safety suites offered by Origami Risk. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Jeff, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Kevin. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, very, uh, very grateful for, the, um, for this chance to have this discussion. And uh, also very appreciative of the uh, opportunity to partner with Jeff and Jenna at Azinga. So uh, thank you very much uh, in advance for doing this with us. Uh, just a bit of an agenda before we get started. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about, just generally, I'm going to speak about what is integrated risk management as a whole. This won't take very long. Um, and then we'll move into having uh, Jeff, Emmerich, and Jenna speak about the safety and risk collaboration at Azinga. Um, they're going to talk a little bit more in depth about um, really how they leverage integrated risk management at Ozinga. And then we'll open it up for some questions and answers towards the end of the, towards the, end of the webinar here. All right, um, moving ahead here. So what everyone wants to know, why would you care about integrated risk management? Why would you care about a synergy between safety and risk? Um, you know, I'll just say in my experience, um, certainly here at Origami and um, as well in, in prior roles and capacities, um, risk and safety have always partnered together. And it has been my experience when clients that I'm consulting with or clients that I'm advising with, or even on the other side of things, um, when I functioned as a risk analyst. Uh, risk managers, safety managers, leadership from both organizations really do tie together. And, um, you know, the thing about um, integrated risk management is it allows safety and risk to kind of connect the dots between uh, where things are happening in the organization, where the organization is headed from a mitigation perspective. When you have programs 
that have a strategic risk objective with a ultimate final goal or a final impact, you get more investment from those various stakeholders in those two organizations, as well as beyond other departments entirely, when there is a collaborating um, common denominator, let's just say, and uh, a common language that everyone's speaking, that's usually what manifests in an integrated risk management approach. So since I've been saying integrated risk management so much, let's define it. So integrated risk management, uh, it's data sharing. It is something that has been defined by some of the industry analysts like Gartner as an organization agreeing <clears throat> that they're going to utilize a set of practices and processes as a very a risk aware culture and um, use enabling and supporting technologies to really allow the visibility of those um, risk and safety performances in an effort to then measure and improve their decision-making process um, as a business. And we'll get into what this really means in, in coming slides here, but integrated risk management is ultimately a way for a company to take the data they're collecting, put it into a platform that not only these two departments use, but other departments as well, and get gain useful analytics out of it around financial decisions. That's really what gets everyone's attention is the, is the financial impacts, right? Um, and then they use those um, financial decisions to help mitigate risks going forward. Okay. So in practice, in the real world, where have we seen integrated risk management in action? Safety teams are usually uh, measuring lagging indicators like incidents that are occurring, and they use investigations to uh, arrive at root causes for those incidents. Safety then puts proactive measures like corrective actions in place to reduce the potential of those same types of incidents from occurring again. Risk teams are analyzing the financial impacts of lagging indicators like incidents and injuries and using the cost of these incidents to establish a measure of the risk of the organization. A typical, you know, a false slip and trip claim that injures a specific body part. Well, most risk people can tell you exactly what their perspective on how much that's going to cost the organization uh, as well as an insurance level cost. <clears throat> Through an improvement in the reduction of actual losses, um, stemmed from the safety team kind of putting into practice their implementations of en enhanced safety practices, um, risks able to confirm a reduction in those financial costs. So it feeds, they kind of feed each other at the cyclical process. This is a measurement at what we've been calling something total cost of risk, right? The measure of the lagging indicators, the measure of the leading indicators, all of it coming together and all of the finances that are used to really oversee the entire umbrella of risk. Risk is then confirming from a financial lens that the efforts of the safety team are having a measurable impact. So they're giving that feedback to the safety team via a financial, um, financial measurement. And that is what, uh, that allows an organization to really um, confirm that they are improving the, sa the overall safety of the organization. Um, all right, so with that being stated and that kind of being laid out as the introduction to integrated risk management, let's talk uh, specifically about Ozinga's approach to integrated risk management. And so what I'm going to do is um, ask Jeff Emmerich. Um, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about Ozinga? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and everybody on the call. Uh, we are a 95-year-old ready-mix producing company that started back in 1928 in Chicago, hauling coal and oil type stuff back in the day. And uh, we now, our main business is producing concrete, putting it in trucks, and delivering it to customers. That's about the extent. But we also have uh, other affiliated businesses, including rail to ship uh, aggregates, boats, and uh, barges to move stuff. We have quarries where we mine aggregates. We're involved in the cement part of the business as well. Uh, we're currently in the fourth generation of ownership. We're a privately held company. And... Uh, it's come a long way since 1928. It used to be a very old school company and we're working our way into the modern age of safety and risk. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see our purpose statement. The owners have a strong uh, set of values 
and they want to make a positive impact on individuals, their families, and the community for generations. So it's a long-term view of why we do what we do. It's not just to make concrete and make money. It's to have an impact on people. And the nice thing about that statement is it ties directly into safety. We want all of our coworkers to go home safely. We want to take care of our customers on the job sites. And we want to take care of the community that we operate in as well. So that kind of keeps everybody pointed in the safe direction. And it helps us in the safety and risk world to guide our decisions as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Jeff, for our lovely introduction. So why IRM at Ozinga? Uh, Ozinga has been viewed as a high value risk for many years. Essentially, we're categorized into two risk exposures, being construction and heavy auto. Uh, we're construction in the fact that our concrete is being used to as the very foundation uh, for buildings, warehouses, sometimes high rises. And we have these giant concrete trucks on the road every single day. Uh, when you're a heavy transportation company in the era of nuclear verdicts, you, you tend to scare insurers off. They're, they're not jumping at the chance to, to cover you. So with this in mind, and after some bad losses and tough renewals, uh, Ozinga decided to take a more risk-aware approach. And what better way to do that than to put our own skin in the game? Uh, Ozinga's deductibles are high, so high that most of our claim costs are coming out of our own pockets. Uh, we do see significant premium savings because of that, but what I think is most attractive about that approach is a better safety culture as well as more control over our claims. Uh, with the integrated risk management framework, accident and injury information is coming in real time. We can quickly learn from our incidents or auto accidents uh, and take appropriate actions in safety to make sure that they don't happen again. Um, and we're also able to take a more aggressive claims approach. What's key about that for us is knowing when we have liability. Um, when you have liability, you can kind of take two different routes in being mindful of your costs in claims as well as your legal costs. Um, in one scenario, you know, if we're 100% at fault in an auto accident, are we able to get all this person's contact information, reach them right away, and try to mitigate it before we even have to get an adjuster or an attorney involved? Uh, the other avenue being if we're 100% liable and litigation is eminent, we want to make sure that we get, A, the right attorney on the file as soon as we can, and push for mediation and settlement. Uh, Ozinga saw some pretty bad claims where we didn't have all the right information right away, and we believed ourselves not to be at fault. And we were driving up legal costs to a point for a defense we didn't really even have. So why waste money in denial or preparation for trial uh, when you know you're ultimately going to pay? I think the integrated risk management works fairly strongly for Ozinga. We, we've seen many benefits there over the years, thanks to our close collaboration of risk and safety departments, um, as well as our partnership with Origami Risk and using their platform. However, I know we work closely together, but I'm kind of curious to know how the rest of the folks on this call work between risk and safety. Yeah, um, good question, Jenna. Uh, I think what what we're going to do next here is just um, we're going to launch a little poll and get a little um, baseline on attendees. Um, just tell us what is the relationship you have, whether you're in safety, uh, what is your relationship with risk, or vice versa. What's your if you're in risk? What's your relationship with uh, with safety? And we'll kind of wait for the results here. Okay, once everyone's had a chance to select into there, we're going to present some results on the screen here just to give everyone a sense of what, here it is right here. <laughs> Okay, so pretty good mix across the board, some completely separate. Uh, I'll definitely want to talk to some folks, uh, you know, maybe after the call, if you want to talk, uh, we're more than happy to offer there. But just a, a sense of, you know, it is quite a spectrum still, and, and I don't find that too surprising. Um, all right, let's move ahead here. All right, so now, Jeff and Jenna, we're going to talk a little bit about the integrated risk 
management style at Ozinga and uh, through a series of a couple of different questions here. And, and obviously we'll take questions from the audience when, uh, when they have some, but first let's start with, um, just describe to us a little bit about how are your, how are your different teams structured and, and your reporting style there? Absolutely. So um, in regards to the poll, Jeff and I are actually option two. We report through different structures, but we were very highly collaborative with each other. Um, my department, the risk department, consists of three of us, and we report directly through finance. Um, you know, as I kind of mentioned before, deductibles are high, so there's a great financial impact in what we're doing. How are we funding and what are we spending? Uh, my boss reports directly to our chief financial officer, and then myself and our in-house claims resolution manager report to her. Mm -hmm. yeah, on the uh, safety side, uh, we have a VP that's my boss. He reports directly to one of the owners uh, for safety. He's in charge of uh, the EHS function. And then uh, myself and I have uh, full-time safety reps at each of our regions. We're currently in five states and plants in all those different locations and other affiliated things around uh, the country. So we're kind of spread out and each region has their own safety reps that kind of report mm -hmm. to me, but we are very collaborative, as Jenna said, with the uh, risk team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just comment that uh, it is not uncommon for me to see that kind of a setup at organizations where the treasury or financial arm kind of oversees the risk, uh, risk and insurance side of things, and then the operational side kind of oversees the environmental health and safety things. And then what we what you get is that collaboration, not only across your two teams at these levels that you're at, but also way high up in the C-suite. Uh, those, uh, those leaders will have to kind of communicate with each other um, around initiatives that operations wants to put in from a safety perspective or the resulting costs, et cetera, from safety, right? Um, moving ahead here. Tell us, um, how did you collaborate to get into this integrated risk management approach that we're talking about today? What, what spawned that and how did you work towards it? Uh, I think we collaborated to achieve IRM uh, in a few different ways. Um, one of them being including Jeff uh, in our insurance renewals. Um, my boss came into her position around 2017, 2018. And up until that point, uh, none of our insurers or more specifically underwriters had never met Jeff. And let me be the first to tell you that underwriters want to meet safety professionals. They're the ones in the field every day, putting in policies and procedures to prevent losses. So every year we have um, a few different strategy calls with a ton of different underwriters on the call. And Jeff gets a safety update every single time. Uh, he's there with us in the process from start to finish. And when we wrap up the results, we let him know um, if we made any premium changes, if we took on a higher deductible. Um, it's it's highly collaborative. I, I think it was kind of eye opening for him when he got brought into this to see like what we were spending, uh, all the strategy that is involved in how much what he does impacts how we insure. Um, and it was actually interesting because when Jeff's um, boss, our executive vice president of environmental health and safety, he came from a previous employer where risk and safety didn't work together. And mm -hmm. he was a little unsure how that worked. And I think almost a little bit uncomfortable. But um, as soon as we brought him in on the fold, he was able to see why we collaborate and how important it is that we do collaborate. Um, another thing that we do, and I'm not sure if many others do this on the call, but uh, we have our claim reviews together. Um, our claim process, especially workman's compensation, is it's very collaborative. Uh, we get together once a quarter with uh, risk, safety, operations. Um, some of our executive leaders are in the calls as well. And we talk about each open workman's comp claim. Uh, we're all working together to make that employee whole. Uh, what light duties options do we have? How do we want to go about this with settlements? Um, they're able to get the full extent of an injury. They're able to see where this starts and where it could potentially go, depending on how we handle things. Um, another way, too, is with uh, using the origami risk platform. Um, when we took on the REMIS or the risk management insurance suite, uh, we worked collaboratively the entire process. We designed the incident forms, claim forms, dashboards, reports, um, anything that went into it, we discussed it. And this worked so well that Jeff actually brought me in on when they purchased the environmental health and safety suite. 
And then most importantly too, and then Jeff kind of touched on this earlier, but I think we're unified by our company's purpose. You know, we want to make a positive impact on people in our communities as well as our coworkers. At, at the end of the day, we want everyone to go home safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great story. I, I mean, um, I am certainly seeing and have seen a lot of um, more underwriters uh, going out into the field and witnessing for themselves, um, you know, the safety, uh, the safety features that are in place, the safety programs that are in practice. And as a safety person, Jeff, I'm assuming you're more than happy to promote that. <laughs> you're more than happy to kind of speak and have those kind of people come in and, and witness for their, with their own eyes, like what's actually happening so that they can be um, more objective and not subjective when they're going back to underwrite and do their job, which really, you know, really consists of spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff, um, looking at past trends when they have some perspective, some story around safety. It really helps them know that uh, an organization like yours is moving in the right direction. That is that fair? That's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. Having uh, where I when we were smaller and I started in this position, I was kind of just managing safety, and then the financial people did the renewals. They'd come into my office and they would tell me, "Okay, here's our new deductible. It went up again. Here's our new premiums." I had no idea how they came up with those numbers. <laughs> and then once we started collaborating. Uh, I started meeting the underwriters. We'd show them our trucks because what we do is kind of unique. There's not a lot of people that understand the ready mix concrete business. And we'd sit them in the cab of the truck. They could look around. They could climb the ladder. They'd see our plants and see what we do. And then they'd see the additions we're making on our trucks, the improvements we're making on things to make them feel comfortable that we're not just reacting. We're being proactive. And we're not just sitting around that the safety guys understand how a claim can go bad. And what a lawsuit looks like at the end of the process and how to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Underwriters are definitely looking down the road, <laughs> right? That's the, that's their job is to look ahead. And if they can see some of the enhancements and improvements that you're making, I think that certainly gets factored in. Okay. Um, great. Uh, great story there. Let's move ahead here. So tell us, uh, Jenna and Jeff, uh, what are some ways that you recommend, since you've already broken down those silos, those barriers, what are some ways you can um, recommend other professionals, uh, your peers, to do the same? Yeah, well, hopefully it won't be the way we kind of got motivated to go with some bad rules. <laughs> and uh, so when I we started having our file reviews, I got finally invited to those and see what was going on. I realized that the guys in the field need to hear this. And we're not a publicly held company. So a lot of this stuff is internal. The numbers we have, the dollars we spend, the owners kind of kept it themselves. And I asked them if we could start bringing in the operations guys to these file reviews to see. And the VPs started coming and seeing. And one of them actually took me out to lunch after the meeting and said, pulled out our book of claims and said, how do I stop this? I'm embarrassed. My division has the most claims. And then he started to make changes in his group. But it was because he went to a risk meeting he'd never been to before. He started to see the value of that. And then it's easier in safety to get stuff done when the people spending the money see that repairing this piece of pavement in our yard is a lot cheaper than repairing somebody's back. Those safety decisions get a lot easier to justify so once we had the openness about the claims, uh, it was a lot more impactful. And then the whole time I started getting involved as well in the mediations of some of our lawsuits and getting involved in with the comp claim resolutions, and sitting in a room with a mediator and your attorneys listening to the other attorneys tell you what your guys did wrong and you know it's not true, kind of gives you an incentive to find ways to avoid getting there. And if you do get to that point, having as much on our side as we can. So it it kind of closed the circle of something happened. We did a bunch of stuff in the meantime, and then we got to this bad place. What can we do at the beginning of the claim to move that? And a lot of it is using the software that we have with origami where we put everything in one spot. Something happens, all the pictures go in there, all the notes go in there, all the interviews go in there, the video from the trucks, video from the yards in one place. And then we have one place to look at that in the risk people are able to see it right away too. They can start to assess how bad is this going to be? What's going to happen down the road? And because of that, we also started to have Monday calls 
Every Monday, we discuss the incidents that happened the previous week. And Origami makes that really easy. I created a dashboard that shows everything that happened the previous uh, week. It goes on on Friday to all the people on the call to see what's coming so they can prepare to talk about their region's incidents. And then Monday morning, another one goes out that's updated with anything that happened over the weekend or happened on Friday afternoon. And then we discuss every incident on that call. And we've got so many operations people on there that are the ones making the decisions in the field. Jenna and her boss can decide what we want to do for risk. I can decide what I want to do for safety. But if the guys in the field aren't conveying that message to the workers, none mm -hmm. of that matters. So having this one place where we can put all the information, people can access things like photographs, not just for insurance purposes, but for training purposes. We'll take videos from our trucks of an accident and we'll put them out for training to our guys so they can see and have it not happen to them. And the other thing is, since we're spread out across the country, something might happen in Indiana that people in Wisconsin would used to never hear about. And now they have that information and they can make this, hey, we don't want that to happen up here. What can we do? And uh, the renewal and the marketing involving safety with that, like we talked about, was huge. Now I know what kind of things the insurers are looking for. And now uh, the risk people know what we can do on the safety side. And if we ever run into an issue where we got to really push something here, it's nice to have the insurance people come in and say, you know what, it's going to cost us this much more in premiums or this much more if we have a mm -hmm. bad lawsuit. We're working together as a team to get stuff done. The other thing we do is uh, we invite them to our uh, safety Christmas party <laughs> last week. We had the uh, insurance people come because uh, they know how to party. <laughs> Yeah, they the the insurance people usually spice up the holiday party. That's that's been my experience for sure. <laughs> um, it's great. And so, Jenna, I think um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can also collaborate with uh, Jeff, witness what they're doing from a safety perspective, and then come renewal time, make a really educated decision about uh, Ozinga's appetite for risk in in the terms of. Uh, deductibles or retentions that you feel comfortable um, taking on, uh, knowing that the safety, knowing that safety measures are in place to fix and prevent incidents uh, that might have happened in the past. Uh, just, to, just as an aside, is that a fair statement? No, I, I mean you took the words right out of my mouth, Jeff. Absolutely, and I think we break down those barriers by getting a seat at the table and giving all the right people a seat at the table. Um, it's, it's shared learning and, you know, yes, this is more pertaining to risk. Um, but you know, there's certain elements too, that Jeff is always willing to educate me on like OSHA, whether something's recordable or not. I think we just, we share knowledge and we help each other grow. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, you know, would, would all of the, would all this be possible without, obviously, a platform in which to view data and make decisions. What your thoughts on this? What, why would you leverage a technology? Yeah, I think having technology for your integrated risk program is key. And it's, it's about having the right technology that's best going to serve your needs. Um, you know, I meet a lot of people, and this used to be once us too, that everything's done in Excel. And I think we're to a point uh, with technology that it's it's got to be beyond Excel. You you need a platform that all the right people have access to. Um, it needs to be able to collect a lot of data and store that data um, with, you know, with a Remis like Ozinga has in the EHS suite. Um, it just better helps you prepare for your risk strategy um, because you're getting that data in real time and all of the right people are able to access the information. Um, I know from risk, we are in a data-driven um, time. You know, we can certainly go to our CFO and say, hey, I think we had to buy this more coverage or maybe we need to take a higher deductible on this piece of the program, but you have to have the data to show why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think um, it's an interesting point uh, both of you have been making is, um, not only, you know, the, the technology you're leveraging, but how is it being utilized in an IRM strategy? I mean, Jeff, you mentioned uh, some of those reports that you can sit down in a meeting with that are being generated for, for you to have these discussions. Tell us a little bit more, Jeff and Jenna, what, what this looks like from an 
integrated risk management perspective. Sure. So as Jenna mentioned, my boss came from another company that used origami, but only on the Remis side. And he used a separate platform for tracking the safety stuff there. And when he came on board here, we were just looking at getting the EHS. So we looked at several systems. And the thing that made it easier for us to go with origami was we we're already using it on the Remis side. We already had our people in the system. We already had our locations in the system. And the biggest thing was it happens to be the same software that our TPA uses to download mm. their claim information to us. So that made it really one package to fit everything in there. <clears throat> so when we go from an incident to a claim that goes reported to the insurance company, we literally click a box on our uh, our claim and internally, and it sends up all the information goes up to the carrier. So we don't have to retype stuff or re-enter stuff. It's all set up so it goes up there. And then every week they download our financials. So we have weekly updates on how the claims are costing us. And they can see that and uh, other people. And that all gets reported uh, easily within a company because it's all in one place. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we're using with the technology and the system is our ability to get better at following up on corrective actions. In the past, something bad would happen. We'd be like, yeah, we can't let that happen again. We got to do this and this, but there wasn't any follow-up. And the EHS function of this is so customizable and so nice. We were able to create corrective actions off of our own custom-made investigation report that sends reminders to people that, hey, this still hasn't been fixed. This still hasn't been fixed. Get on this. And we can see reports of what's still out there to get done, what's been done. It's really, really customizable because the way we do things at our company is a little different than everybody else, and we want it just right our way. The other things that it does is that uh, investigations are better. We created our custom form so that anybody could sit down and just go through a whole bunch of stuff and come to the real root causes that we feel are important, and then we can report on those. What are our most common root causes? Where are things happening, and what are we seeing as well. So that, that tight integration has been really nice to the point where we're going to add on the environmental stuff here too, because we just saw the benefit and the risk. We saw it in the EHS uh, safety part, and now we're going to add the environmental part to it also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I advanced the slide on you a little too quickly, but I, you know, I want to point out that um, where the incidents and where risk occurs generally in the field, right? I mean, that is, um, usually something where uh, it all starts. And so uh, having a technology that's going to allow you to capture that information and work from it, reducing lag time, uh, certainly a one lever you can pull on getting in front of those, uh, of those claims. Yeah. Jeff. So with the mobile stuff, is that if that's where you're, you're heading on this, uh, mm -hmm. we really do use that a lot with the phones. Everyone's got a phone and that's what my boss's previous company had. It was that it was all app based and phone, but we decided not to use that because it didn't tie in with everything as easily as we have. So origami was able to recreate stuff he was familiar with in origami and kind of make it our own uh, job site audits where we deliver our concrete. We're not in control of the safety there. Some general contractor or some contractor is in charge of making sure the site is safe. We just show up, deliver the concrete. But sometimes we're put in unsafe situations and we want our drivers to be able to report that. We want our safety people to go out and see the jobs maybe before we start so they can see what things we can make it changes to before things get going to make it safer for our guys. So we created job site audits that are real simple. It's just a few questions on the phone, but it lists the things that we think are important to safely deliver the concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, my boss's previous company was really big into behavior-based observations and being able to go out in the field, see a worker doing his job and then praise them for what they're doing or uh, give some helpful tips to how to do the job better or safer. But we needed a way to record that and see our people really doing it. And we created our own custom behavior-based observation. It's one question that leads into other questions. You can attach pictures to it. You can attach other information. You can assign corrective actions from it. So mm -hmm. if, if they're on a job site and they see something unsafe, they can assign that to somebody to follow up that gets tracked and all that just kind of lives to the system until it's done. Yeah, you know, we're, um, we're actually seeing an uptick in the number of organizations that want to track near misses. And really that does require 
uh, you know, being right then and there when a near miss or a near hit or what, whatever the nomenclature is when that occurs is having that quick ability to just whip the phone out, right? Take, snap a quick picture and take a, you know, take a footnote on why was it a near miss and those kind of things can have tremendous results uh, flowing into the, the overall safety to risk chain. Uh, just kind of understanding uh, oh, something that almost happened, right? Um, Jeff, I thought we would just go and maybe tell us a little bit about these these weekly safety reviews that you do and, and some examples there. Sure. So we wanted to have this call, but I wanted to have information that would be useful to the people on the call, not just for the actual things we're going to talk about, but how we doing as a company so I created this dashboard just on my own, took a few hours of work, and uh, it comes out on Friday. Like I said, it comes out on Monday, and that number 12 was the week uh, we had 12 incidents in that week, and we report everything at the company, no matter how minor it gets reported, so we can see our trends. We don't punish people for reporting incidents. We want to know everything that's going out there so they're not afraid to report. The number one in the green there is our, uh, it was a near miss. We had a near miss that week so we talked about it i made it green so it didn't look bad i can change the colors on stuff because i think that's fun mm -hmm. uh, the total incidents at that time we had 671 across the company and then below that the three was injuries that week that they've had and then the zero and zero were osha recordable and lost time something we never used to really be able to track till the end of the year here we created some data inputs from our payroll to show the number of hours we're working every week and then to show the number of people working and we have almost live OSHA logs going because of the integration with the TPA and the way we track this so we can see our rates every week that we want to see. Fortunately that week there were no lost time or OSHA recordable on there and I made that green because that's good. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, this was another kind of look at some of your weekly safety reviews yeah. on, on the incidents. Tell us yeah, a little so bit about this. Yeah, so this is further down that a dashboard that gets out and sent out as a PDF attached to an email every week. And on that call, we not only have ops people in the field and safety people, we've got the risk people on there. So when they hear an incident that's happened, they can start asking questions like, well, did you do this? Why did you send them to the ER instead of the clinic? Or, hey, we need to really get on this one. We need more pictures of this or we need some more interviews. So risk is right there at the beginning, hearing what's going on. And they're anticipating the long-term impacts. But not only that, but the questions they ask are helping our people in the field learn what they got to get early on in these to keep it from going bad. We also have some senior drivers on the call that are the ones training our other drivers. We want them to hear what's going on across the company so they can incorporate that into their training with the other people. Mm -hmm. uh, vice presidents that run each region are on the calls as well. And this charts here that you see with the donut grass show who had the most incidents that week. And our VPs are very competitive. <laughs> they, uh, when they see they've had a lot, they kind of put their head down and try to get better. And when they don't have a lot, they praise their people for that. So it kind of tells us where things are happening in the company for that week. And then you can kind of see that number eight down there. That shows uh, the number of people who are currently off work at the company. They're off for work comp reasons. And covered up by that other little box shows people who are on medical restrictions, the number of people. So we have a live update of how many people are currently not working in our company. And then that little pull-out box there is actually what we talk about for an incident on the week. So it's got the date of the incident, how long it took to get reported, the lag time I put on there. So if some regions are taking longer to report stuff, we want to know why. Uh, tells us where it happened, gives their name, how long they've worked here. That's kind of people want to know, was it a new guy or was it a senior guy that had to, what, what kind of coverage it hit or did, would hit if it became a claim. And then uh, when they complete the investigation, the narrative can show up on this report too if they've done it in time for the call. And then some other information about if it's a medical claim. Mm-hmm. And then um, just analytics galore. I mean, some of these analytics are yeah. great and people love analytics. Tell us a little bit about these. Sure. So this is like our history for the year to date at the time of this was how many incidents we talked about on the calls. And we're in the Midwest here uh, in Chicago area. It gets cold in the winter. So our work slows down and the number of incidents kind of go down as well. And we can see that when we get busier, the incidents go up. So we have to focus more on that. Those kind of trends are in there. 
But in the box with the four pie charts, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we had seen in that top left one uh, where it says where incidents happened year to date, we saw about an even split between on job sites and in the yard. But then below that where injuries happened, I broke it down to like, where are we hurting people? And we found out the way the majority of our injuries are happening in our own yards. So we can't control safety on the job site as much, but we're, we're seeing that our own yards, our home court, we're having a majority of our injuries happen in there. So the ability to break down the numbers in a way that people can understand kind of opens some eyes. We know our job sites can be risky, but we didn't realize our own yards were that risky as well. And then the typical stuff in the bottom right of that, that one there, like what's our top 10 injury causes? Of course, you could all say slips, trips, and falls. This just verifies that it's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see if there's some that sneak up that aren't what you'd normally expect. Those are the ones we kind of focus on as well. Yeah, I mean, what's the number, way, number one way to prevent false slips and trips? Just nobody move anywhere, right? Just lay down the rest of your life, right? That's the, that's yeah. the only way. <laughs> yeah, bubble, bubble wrap, too, we're thinking about. Yeah, right? Uh, okay, yeah. so, um, you know, I'd like to know a little bit more, and I think everyone else will, everyone else would. Um, tell us about the results. So tell us, you know, this is really the full realization of integrated risk management after it's been in practice for you for some time. Um, you know, how, how is this quantifying uh, for you? So let's let's hear a little bit about that. Sure. Um, the most obvious being, as you can see on the screen, on the screen is uh, reduction in claims. Um, if it's a little hard to see, our workers' compensation claims are highlighted in the light blue, and then our auto liability claims are in the dark blue. As you can see, since 2017, our claims are trending down. Um, a couple of things that you can't see on the graph, for example, in 2020, that is the year that we integrated um, using origami risk. Uh, I believe, which year did we install the cameras in the trucks? Uh, the original cameras yes. were in uh, 2017. Yeah. Okay, and then what about the forward facing? The forward, fa the driver facing ones, yes. we started in 2020. In 2020, yeah. okay. So in 2020, and I'll let Jeff kind of add a little bit more later, but uh, we installed forward facing cameras in our caps. Um, this allowed us to better see, you know, we had a lot of accidents where we didn't know what the driver was doing. So with the forward facing cameras, um, we're able to see, is this driver distracted? Was he taking a drink of water? Um, we're, and what we do is with all of Jeff's safety pros, they sit down with the drivers and then they coach him on it. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So we were able with those cameras to have our senior drivers or our safety people, depending on the region, actually review the videos with the driver to see what they could have done to improve. And we've seen a huge improvement in our drivers because of the coaching. We also integrated Smith system training to help them talk about ways to improve their driving. And we were able to see the results of that already. So as Jenna said, the dark blue parts of those bar charts were our auto claims. And in 2020, we started implementing the Smith system and the smart drive and the coaching. And we can see that that part of the charts got smaller. And this is just for our Chicago region here. I pulled up Chicago because that's the urban environment we drive in where it's the hardest to drive. It's the most traffic, the most pedestrians, the most bicyclists out there. And we actually have seen an improvement in that stuff. So we were able to justify, hey, we spent this money on the cameras. We spent the money on the training. And look, it's paid off. So sometimes safety people don't just spend money. Sometimes we can do things to help save money <laughs> as well. I think another area too, where we've seen some really good results is uh, we've had some very successful casualty renewals. Uh, we actually just came off one this past spring. So um, back in kind of the 2017 to 2019 timeframe, we, we had some very tough renewals. We had a lot of carriers say no to us, which uh, was very stressful and very hard to get coverage. Um, Fast forward to 2023, um, we have such great data. We we brought the underwriters out. Jeff did a really good presentation on what we're doing safety-wise. And we had at least three carriers practically falling over themselves to ensure our program. Uh, another beneficial thing we'll see to this too is with your casualty insurance, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but it's your auto, it's your GL, it's your comp, and then it's your lead umbrella. Usually our umbrella underwriter won't come in with a quote until the main casualty has provided their quote because they want to see 
is the GL and the auto going up? Should we go up also? This year, because we had such a successful meeting with them and we went to dinner, we had several calls, um, they were able to come in with their quote before the main primary even did. So with all the actions we're taking, we're seeing a lot more um, success with pricing as well as um, a quicker casualty renewal process. And then just another example to give is um, with the data that we had, we, we actually made a very big decision a couple of years ago in regards to the week of Thanksgiving. Um, after running some reports through Origami, we were able to see that all of our um, really tough claims, specifically to injuries, were happening the week of Thanksgiving. And, you know, kind of what we inferred is drivers are probably stressed, you know, they, they'd have to get everything ready for their families, and then they'd have to come right back at it on Fridays. So after discussing it with safety, insurance, as well as our ownership, we decided to have all drivers off the Black Friday or the Friday following Thanksgiving. And some of our customers actually followed our lead. And the nice thing about that is the drivers didn't have to worry about, well, can I make plans? They could buy plane tickets knowing they weren't going to be working on that Friday and they could take a long weekend, which they'd never been able to do before. And that hovering over their heads in the past, I think, led to the possibility of distractions, not being able to focus on the job because they're worried about, I won't know till Wednesday night if I'm going to have to work Friday. The owners make this announcement in October so people can make plans. And we've seen a really significant reduction in our uh, that time frame of serious claims as well that's amazing uh, because it's already anxiety riddled, riddled to drive in chicago as a 20-year chicago and i'll just tell you that alone as, as you've already commented so that's an uh, that's an amazing story right there uh, just giving those uh, drivers the ability to kind of see ahead and let them function that week without having to have that extra kind of um, worries around them anything else on this or should we um, should we move ahead with some questions and, and get to the get to the next slide here? No, we can move ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, before we address some questions, just kind of summarizing where we've seen things. Um, crew partnership, Jenna and Jeff, you guys definitely even sitting in the same room for the webinar. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's evident. Going to the holiday party together is certainly something that speaks volumes there. Um, the business results, you've definitely shown us how Ozinga has really turned uh, itself around from a risk perspective, improved the safety, all of these things are, are really um, through the collaboration of your two departments and, and you guys spear, spearheading a lot of this. Um, technology, using the technology to really um, bring other leaders in your organization into the knowledge um, of where things are lying from a risk and safety perspective and helping them help make decisions around how to um, reduce your total cost of risk. And uh, just pointing out Ozinga's success story here is just one of many that we've seen where this is something that uh, can be done uh, for all those that answered the poll where you're not really collaborating. I mean, this is certainly food for thought, right? Um, let's move ahead. Uh, and some questions. Before we get into questions, just mentioning that, you know, you can learn more about uh, this integrated risk management as, a, as an entire topic uh, simply by going to our website at this address or even using the QR code here. Um, Kevin, uh, just kicking it back to you, what, what kind of questions do we have here? Well, no, we've got some good ones. So thank you and excellent. Great job to Jeff, Jeff and Jenna. We thank you for sharing your insights and your expertise. I'm going to get to the questions in a minute, but again, just want to let everyone know about that evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after the webinar, and we really appreciate your input as it gives us um, just more input on, on future webcasts. We do have some questions in the queue, but again, if you'd like to ask one of our panelists, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type the question, and click the send button to submit. With that, let's get to some questions. This one is for Jeff Emmerich, and it asks, is the dashboard that was referenced SharePoint-based? And if not, what MS Office products have you seen, have you had success with? So I, I don't know what happens on the back end on our HR stuff, but that does go from our ERP somehow into Origami. The gnomes that work in IT work with Origami to make sure the data comes. So I'm not sure what it's using on the back end there, but it works real nice. Once they have that initial call and they all speak each other's language, the data just goes in uh, real nice. And then the stuff from the TPA 
comes up and down real well too. We're even integrate with our fleet department to keep the trucks updated where they're at. When we get new trucks, that all goes in there. Our locations, if we have a new location, Jenna can enter that stuff real easy. So I'm not sure uh, if that answers the question. Let me know if you have a different type of answer for that. But as far as other Microsoft Office products we've used, you know, we, we still do a little bit on spreadsheets, but that's been so nice. If I find myself having to put, do something on a spreadsheet, I usually go right to origami and say, how can I do this without a spreadsheet? I, I don't like using spreadsheets. When one of my people wants to use a spreadsheet, I tell them, what can I build for you so you don't have to do that? All righty, thank you. Next question is staying in that room for, for Jeff Emmerich and for Jenna. And it asks, regarding your decision to invest in dash cams, was that a joint decision between risk management and EHS? Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit more before my time, so you can probably speak best to it. Yeah, so our first cameras we did was, uh, I was kind of sneaking them into trucks. And I actually had some drivers asking for dash cameras because they're like, oh, you wouldn't believe what just happened. I would have got blamed for that. Can you put a camera in my truck? So we started putting cameras in the trucks here and there, not officially. And then one day we had an incident that was totally not our fault. In the snow, a van came around a corner uh, in our lane, ran into it. We happened to have a camera in that truck. And when the owners saw that, they're like, put cameras in all the trucks. But we started with just the forward facing cameras because we didn't want to create a whole big uh, worry about drivers think we're spying on them. And then we did that for a couple of years. And then we had some more accidents where we knew what happened outside the truck, but we didn't know what the driver was doing at the time. And some of them were pretty significant. And our owners finally said, forget it. We're getting the driver facing cameras. We don't care what blowback there is. We've seen the value of the cameras out front. Now let's move to the training and coaching part of the camera thing. So we use a, a system that whenever there's a, an event, it gets sent to the company, they review it, and then they send it back to us telling us what they saw. And then it goes to a coach for a driver. They sit down with them and show them, or they send them an email on the truck telling them what they did. And we've seen huge results from that. Like Jenna said at the beginning, if we know it's our fault, we want to take care of it quickly. If we know it's not our fault, sometimes it gets taken quickly by sending the video to the other attorney and saying, this isn't going to go anywhere. You're wasting your time. Thank you. Next question is for Jeff Enzinger. It asks, what are some examples from other companies of how technology is being used to bridge the gap between risk and safety teams? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, we've got varying examples of clients on this spectrum of uh, integrated risk management maturity, doing this, um, speaking the same language, and then measuring financial impacts of total cost of risk. One is a, a published, a publicized public story, case story that we've got a success story with Cheesecake Factory, um, whereby they're measuring the uh, safety uh, policies and procedures in practice at each of their regions, uh, each of their stores or restaurants across the regions, and then they will provide financial incentives according to how each of those um, different markets or different uh, stores will follow those policies and procedures. That's all detailed out on our website. You can go there and find that, but we have other clients doing something where doing something similar where um, they allocate the costs of claims or allocate the costs of safety measures apportioned across their organization, global footprints in some cases, um, and then you know use those as financial incentives to help um, share um, you know share the share the information of, of risk reporting uh, and and impress upon those those individual leaders at those different markets or different regions um, that they have some skin in the game, right? Um, All righty. Next question is also concerning Ozinga. It asks, how does how does it work with Ozinga with near miss reporting? Do they go to the supervisor for investigation and or to the safety committee or to the safety rep? So at the company, everybody reports everything, no matter how minor. During our Monday calls, I'll have people texting me like, "Why are we even talking about this? We backed into a garbage can. Why do we care?" because that could have been a person. It could have been a car. It doesn't matter how expensive it was at that moment. It's what was the driver thinking at the time and what can we do to help them not do that again? But a near miss. So when these people report, everything goes to the, their supervisor who sends it to safety. 
And believe it or not, we still use paper incident reports in the yard because it's just easier for our batch guys who are making the concrete to hand a guy a piece of paper and say, fill this out. And our drivers don't have phones. We don't allow them to have phones on the job, so they can't get on the phone and do that. So they fill out a piece of paper. It goes to the safety rep, and they review it to decide if it's a near miss or if it's not a near miss. But it still goes in the system. Like is you never know when something that looks like it's not a big deal. Five years later, you're talking about it in a lawsuit. So we treat everything as if it's going to turn out to be bad. We gather everything as soon as we can and as thoroughly as we can. All right. Thank you. Next question is for Jenna. And it asks, how are you able to leverage the safety program data in your conversations with brokers at Renewal? Kevin, that's a really good question. Um, so from the risk side, I can certainly paint a picture of safety, but I think it's best supported with the actual data. Um, per my role, I'm answering all the insurer's tough, you know, subjectivities. How many yards did we pour for the year? How many miles driven did all of our trucks transport? Um, what are we spending on claims? Anything of that nature. But I think what we're doing actually in the field safety wise is what really appeals to the underwriter. So just for an example, um, this year we had a renewal on one of our um, access policies and we invited the underwriter out. Um, before that, you know, we submitted him the, the certain amount of data, but we invited him out to meet with Jeff and to see all of the efforts we were putting forward safety wise. Um, Ironically enough, after this meeting that we thought went really successful, uh, we learned from our insurer that they were no longer going to be writing these types of policies. They were actually exiting the market. Um, but coincidentally, the same carrier wanted to take a look at our casualty program. So they were able to use all of the safety data that we had provided for the policy that they were no longer going to insure, but were interested in insuring an entirely different piece of our program. So, and we saw a lot of success there. But I, I think risk managers, we can certainly provide the data, but safety people can best paint that picture of what we're doing every day. We look at it as trying to make them comfortable with what we do, help them understand what we do, and let them know we know what we're doing. We're not just letting things happen or, oh, yeah, we just report stuff. We are actively doing things, including improvements on our trucks. Every time we get a new bunch of trucks, we've done something to it to make it a little safer. And they can see that. We show them that. We show them the truck. We did this, this, and this. It costs us more money, but it makes our guys safer and the public safer as well. All right. Another question for you, Jeff Emmerich. Uh, it asks, do you have any examples of results that you've seen from a safety perspective other than the reduction in claims? Yeah, we are closing the loop on our corrective actions much better. We have monthly audits that go out to the guy in charge of a plan. Every month he gets an email assigning him a an audit to go through the plant. And we don't use the canned origami audit. They have tons of audits. They have more audits than I could even look at. But we created our own that was something simple for a yard guy to go through. Our mechanics at the beginning of the month get an email to go through their shop. And we can track if they've done that. And then if they do a corrective action, it sits out there reminding us till it gets done. The behavior-based have helped a lot. We're having more conversations with our salesmen who never felt like they were part of the safety program are now out being required to talk to a driver at some point and record it. Our job site audits are showing that we're changing things on the job sites to make our drivers safer when a driver complains or when somebody out there complains. So we're, we're seeing it in those uh, non-tangible ways. And instead of just tracking the lagging indicators like we used to, we can now track those kind of leading. How many audits are we doing? How many behavior-based observations are we doing? And are we seeing a trend? And then we track the coaching and the smart drive uh, with our driver's camera stuff. We track that. And we see improvements just based on that. So it's kind of a snowball effect. The more good things we see, the more we're able to do and add on. Origami is so flexible. They'll do anything we ask them to do as long as we can explain it to them. All right. I know we're we're winding down, getting close on time, but as as we do so, what else has been left unsaid? Anything you all would like to to add as we get, get set to close today? I'm good. Nothing much that I feel needs to be added. Yep. Good to hear. Okay. Well, again, we've getting getting there on running out of time, so we we apologize for that, but. 
um, know that we got to, to pretty well every question. I think maybe some may be trickling in, but any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to our speakers today. Um, once again, please uh, do take the time to fill out the forthcoming evaluation survey and give us your feedback. With that, we'll end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Jeff Enzinger, Jeff Emmerich, Jenna Beachley, everyone at Origami Risk, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day.